And turning Thanks. now to the Omicron coronavirus variant that has the world on edge, at least 70 countries and territories have now imposed travel restrictions on several African countries after South Africa alerted the world to the variant. Epidemiologist and infectious disease specialist Dr. Celine Gounder was a member of the Biden-Harris Transition COVID-19 Advisory Board. And she's joining Walter Isaacson to tell us more about how the U.S. should be responding. Thank you, Christian and Dr. Celine Gounder. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So the big news today is that the CDC recommends that all adults should, they say should, get their booster shot. At first, a few weeks ago, you were a little bit cautious, saying maybe you weren't going to get that booster. Have you changed your mind? And if so, why? Walter, the reasoning uh, has changed significantly. The debate that we were having, scientists were having, about boosters before was really about waning immunity. Were we seeing waning protection against infection and were we seeing waning protection against more severe disease? That calculus has shifted now. This is really a, a debate now or a, a decision about whether Omicron is immune evading and can you overcome some degree of immune evasion by giving an extra dose of vaccine. We know from another variant, the beta variant, which was an earlier immune evading variant, that you can, in fact, overcome that immune evasion with another dose of vaccine. So in other words, if this mutation of the Omicron has caused it to be able to evade some of our immune structures just by building up more immunity with a booster shot, uh, we might be able to overcome it. That's right. That's right. So by giving an extra dose, um, you might be able to overcome that relative uh, evasion of the immune system. And it also buys us time, time in which uh, Pfizer, Moderna, other vaccine manufacturers can formulate second generation uh, vaccines that are specific to Omicron. So, you know, if, if that booster buys us six months, that would be quite significant because we think it'll take about three months or so for Pfizer and Moderna to update those vaccines and to get that into manufacturing. Now, tell me what mutations have occurred to make this new variant uh, more dangerous? Well, looking at the uh, Omicron variant, there are over 30 mutations of concern. It's really uh, the best hits of all the scary mutations we've seen in all the different variants. So it's hard to predict exactly how it's going to behave just from its genetic sequence. But what we're seeing, in, in, at least in terms of individual mutations, is concerning. Some of the mutations that are not to the spike protein, but are to the rest of the uh, uh, virus, makes it seem like it could be uh, sort of a stronger variant of the virus. Is that true? Uh, certainly possible. The three main characteristics of, of viruses that we worry about uh, like this is one, is it more transmissible? Is it more infectious? Does it spread more easily from one person to another? And that we certainly saw with the Delta variant. Uh, the second question is, can it evade our immune responses, particularly uh, the immune responses we get from vaccination? Uh, we saw that, as I mentioned, with the beta variant, and we are worried that we might see that with Omicron. And then the third characteristic we really pay attention to is what's called virulence. So in an individual who's infected with the variant, will they have worse disease than with other earlier forms of the variant? And we just don't know really the answer to any of those three questions right now. Now, the mRNA vaccines we have, we, it uses a particular type of coding, you know, it's a messenger RNA that goes after certain parts of the spike protein uh, to replicate it so that our, our system develops immunity to that. Can we tell by looking at the sequence of uh, this new variant how the mRNA vaccine might work? You know, it's really difficult to predict just by looking at a sequence. Um, I do think we will have answers to whether our vaccines uh, provide protective immunity and to what degree uh, against Omicron really within about two weeks. Scientists are hard at work in the lab, and that is a question that can be answered through laboratory testing. Uh, and so I think at least that first of those three key questions we'll have an answer to pretty soon here. Now, the mRNA vaccine can be reprogrammed pretty easily. So if indeed it's not quite uh, aimed at uh, 
given immunity to this uh, variant, you could just sort of put in a new sequence. If they do that, if BioNTech or Pfizer or Moderna are able to reprogram these uh, vaccines, will they have to go through clinical trials again or can we get them as quickly as possible? So the approval process is a bit different for an updated vaccine. It's more similar to uh, the approval the FDA gives for updated flu vaccines every year. And so really they're looking at um, laboratory testing, not those big clinical trials for that approval. It's a, it's a far more expedited process. Explain some of the recent state data to me. Let's start with New Mexico, a place highly vaccinated, and yet it's having one of the worst spikes and it's very warm there, people are still outside, and people generally wearing masks inside. Why does that happen when everybody's doing everything right and getting vaccinated? Well, if you look at the hospitals in New Mexico, they're not just taking New Mexicans. In fact, there's a lot of overflow from Colorado, which we know has also been experiencing a huge spike recently, a lot of overflow from Texas. Uh, which, uh, and I have colleagues in, in New Mexico right now, it's been, it's been creating a lot of challenges for them because they have found themselves in a situation where their ICUs are full of out-of-state um, patients, and they then are trying to call, you know, literally up to 40 local area hospitals for a local New Mexican. Um, so, you know, I, I think we have to remember that this is not confined within our state borders, that what's happening in the state next door can very much impact uh, your hospitals as well. But you look at states like Minnesota, Vermont, New Mexico, having spikes, having a lot of cases, but also having high vaccination rates. That seems counterintuitive. Yeah, Minnesota is a, is a really concerning sign, um, as is Michigan. Uh, they have high vaccination rates, but it is, um, it is not evenly distributed. So if you look at the Twin Cities, they have very high vaccination rates, but if you go out to the rural areas in Minnesota, the vaccination rates drop tremendously. Uh, and even if we say, you know, a state has high vaccination rates, that's high within the US. If you actually compare those numbers to other countries in the world, very few of our states measure up. Um, so if you're only hitting 60, 70% vaccination rates, that's still not nearly enough uh, you still have far too many people susceptible to infection and, and who could still land in the hospital. Should we have more easy to get uh, tests that you can just buy at a drugstore and do self-testing? Would that help? Yes, I, I think it would. I think um, right now the rapid tests range in price from $7 to $25 a piece. That is still far too expensive. If you think about you know, a family of four that might have wanted to test on Thanksgiving Day, uh, at $25 a piece, that's $100 just for that. Um, and so this is really not affordable for, for most people. We really need to make this freely available uh, for free, as have other countries. The UK, for example, you could have them shipped to your home for free. Singapore proactively mailed uh, rapid test kits to their citizens for free. Uh, you know, and then and then there's the behavior change of getting people used to the idea of testing and how do you use the the results uh, to inform your behavior. But I think the biggest obstacle hurdle here is you've got to make it free. Why isn't it free? Why, uh, who makes that decision that is not going to be something covered uh, that would be free? Well, you've got a combination of issues. I think one, um, the demand for these rapid tests has not been consistent. So it's difficult for the, uh, for the producers, the manufacturers of these tests uh, to scale up and to provide um, at scale, cheap rapid testing uh, when they are not sure exactly what the volume of demand is going to be from month to month. And then secondly, it needs to be subsidized uh, by the federal government to, to make it free from there. Do bans on travel make sense now or is the uh, genie out of the bottle? <laughs> I do think, Walter, that the genie is out of the bottle. Travel restrictions can work, uh, but they need to be implemented far more quickly. Our American travel restrictions uh, didn't go into effect until Monday, so you still had several days where people could travel back and forth. Uh, those travel restrictions need to be implemented on citizens, not just foreigners. Uh, and that's much more akin to what countries like uh, Australia and New Zealand did. That also left many of their citizens stranded overseas for months. Uh, and I don't think we had the political will to be that strict. But if you have Americans who are still traveling back and forth to these countries, 
the virus can hitch a ride on them just as it can on uh, somebody from South Africa. 16% of Americans just say they're not going to get vaccinated. What does that mean? Does that mean we'll never be able to stop this or can we get herd immunity? I think herd immunity is off the table. Um, I, I think with respect to that remaining 16% that says that they will never get vaccinated, I think this is a long-term project for all of us, um, public health leaders, community leaders, uh, to really address what is a, an ideological issue, a trust issue, uh, and that's going to take a long time to, to bridge that gap. We can't even vaccinate ourselves more than, say, 80 percent in the United States. Uh, are we ever going to be able to get the rest of the world to be vaccinated enough that we're not going to see these variants? People are talking a lot about we should be focusing on making sure we have vaccines in Africa to stop these variants. Is that really reasonable? Yeah, I, I certainly think we can slow the emergence of variants tremendously by vaccinating the rest of the world. Too much of the world remains unvaccinated, and that includes people right here at home in the United States. Uh, in addition to vaccination, another um, key group we need to be paying attention to are people who are highly immunocompromised. What we have seen is these variants are more likely to emerge from people who are highly immunocompromised who tend, when they get infected, to have longer infections, where, in a sense, it's a training ground for the virus. It keeps mutating and mutating and, and testing different mutations out in those highly immunocompromised people. So that's a group where not only should we vaccinate, but unfortunately, vaccines don't always take in people whose immune systems are weaker. We need to have um, other backups, which would include perhaps using monoclonal antibodies uh, preemptively. So even before they're exposed, giving them perhaps an infusion of monoclonal antibodies every three to four months so that they're already uh, blanketed with this layer of protection. Uh, another thing we could be doing for that particular group is when they are exposed, have a known exposure preemptively, starting them on treatment with the antiviral drugs like Paxlovid and, and monopiravir to prevent them from ending up with an infection or to nip that infection in the bud. I think that's a group we really do have to pay some very special attention to. You were on President Biden's task force, and one of the things you all stressed was the racial inequities that had to be addressed, and something you've talked about on your podcast. Tell me about that. What can we do now to address the inequalities that come out of the COVID uh, situation? Well, this is one reason I think we have to be very careful when we talk about living with COVID, that we do so through a public health lens, so to speak, which means that you're thinking not just about, you know, what does it mean for you, but that you're looking at what it means for entire populations, in particular, um, thinking about vulnerable populations and equity. And so what that might mean for you, you know, I've been vaccinated, I've had my booster, I don't work face-to-face uh, -face with people. I can work from home in my office. Yeah, sure, you know, for you, it might not be, be much of a threat, but I think we need to be thinking more broadly. When we talk about living with COVID, it needs to be how do we all live safely with COVID, not just you, the individual. One of the devastating things about this pandemic has been closing schools, people having a year, sometimes a year and a half, where they aren't in school and we're seeing enormous effects because of that. If Omicron spreads, do you think we should close schools again or should we do everything we can to avoid closing schools? I think we should do everything we can to avoid closing schools. And I think we learned uh, from our experience with prior variants that you can keep schools open as long as you layer certain protective measures. So that includes, of course, masking, uh, improving ventilation and air filtration, buying HEPA air filtration units for classrooms, testing on a regular basis to make sure that the kids who are attending school uh, are not carrying the virus. There, is, there are billions of dollars in the American Rescue Plan, the CARES Act and other, um, the infrastructure bill and so on for um, improving K through 12 school infrastructure, including ventilation and air filtration. Uh, for whatever reason, the school districts have not prioritized spending those funds in that way. And that's truly a missed opportunity to buffer ourselves against whether it's Omicron or other variants. You've had a lot of experience earlier on battling Ebola 
and you are mm -hmm. an aid worker for that. Mm -hmm. Tell me what parallels you see between that and the current virus. Well, one very important parallel is how both epidemics, pandemics have been politicized. And, and that was really mm -hmm. chilling for me back in uh, December of 2019, January of 2020. For me, it was, it was deja vu. Uh, if you think back on the Ebola epidemic, that hit during our 2014 midterm elections. Uh, that was highly politicized, the question of, of travel restrictions at that time how to treat um, returning aid workers at that time. And then on the ground in West Africa, um, they were in the middle of their own presidential elections. And so you saw the response to Ebola, something as simple as, as, simple as hand washing, which you could compare you know, to mask wearing. Both basic hygienic measures were highly politicized in, in that context. Why has it become so politicized here? Well, I, I think part of the problem is um, the pandemic did emerge uh, at a time when, one, this country is extremely polarized, and during a, an election where it was really feared uh, by the former president that this would upset his chances at re-election. You already are hearing politicians saying that Omicron has been invented uh, to win the 2022 midterm elections. Um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, where you have something scary that threatens um, both the health of the people, the economy, the, um, the political stage, I think you do see conspiracy theories emerge in that setting. Dr. Celine Gounder, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Walter. <laughs>